Welcome to the Mama Say Fit podcast. In this episode, we will be chatting with Dr. Stuart Fishbein of Birthing Instincts on vaginal breech birth and his experience transitioning as an obstetrician from a hospital to supporting home birth. In this episode, we will discuss how breech positioning is just a variation of normal, but vaginal breech birth has become less common of an option in the United States. Dr. Stu shares his perspective as an OBGYN on why this decline has occurred and the risk and benefits associated with both a vaginal and cesarean breech birth. Welcome to the Mama Safe Fit Podcast. This is Gina, perinatal fitness trainer and birth doula. And this is Roxanne, labor and delivery nurse and student midwife. And this is the Mama Safe Fit Podcast, where we empower you on your prenatal fitness, birth, and postpartum return to fitness journey. Our podcast shares how to move throughout your pregnancy to stay strong and comfortable. Pain is not a requirement of pregnancy. Understand the science of birth and how to approach recovery after birth. We share our personal experiences as mothers navigating the stage of lives, plus our professional expertise as birth workers and fitness professionals. Our goal is to help you feel confident as you navigate the perinatal time frame for an empowering pregnancy, positive birth, and postpartum journey. We are glad to have you with us on this journey and that you've chosen us to support you. We are excited to have Dr. Stu of Birthing Instincts here with us today to chat about breech birth and positioning during pregnancy. Dr. Stu is an OBGYN who specializes in community-based natural breech and twin birth and supports VBAC, which is vaginal birth after cesarean in Southern California, but now resides in Utah and focuses on training other professionals in breech birth. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Dr. Stuart Fishbein. I went into obstetrics and gynecology after medical school. I did my residency at Cedars Sinai in Los Angeles. I was trained like every other resident in OBGYN in those days. This was the early 80s. In the medical, obviously, medicalized birth was the norm, still is now, and sadly, it hasn't, it's only gotten worse probably. But I was fortunate to be at a residency program and live in an era or a time when breech birth was just considered a variation of normal and a residency program that honored that. As part of my time at Cedar sinai I spent three or four months, I can't remember, at LA County USC Women's Hospital, which was at that time the busiest hospital in the country. They were doing about 22,000 births a year, which is about 65 babies a day. So you try to picture that. And it breaches three or four percent. We're seeing two or three breaches every single day. And I'm doing that for three months every other night, every other 24 hour shift. So I got lucky. I got the training to do breach delivery. And then there were articles coming out in the late 80s, early 90s that said vaginal breach delivery was with proper selection was fine. And there were other articles that were coming out that saying, no, cesarean is better. And then in 2000, almost as if on cue for a profession that was looking for a reason to not have to do breach delivery, came the term breach trial, which was a paper that came out of Canada looking at a number of centers. It was a prospective trial, and they determined conclusively at that time that C-section for breach was safer. The paper was completely flawed, and within two years, they retracted pretty much everything that was in it, but it didn't matter. The damage had been done. And from that point on, breach deliveries were dropped in residency training programs and in most hospitals. Those hospitals that had been part of the study doing breach stopped doing breach delivery. And I think even in my own practice for a while, I just succumbed to the idea that medicalized birth was the best there is. And so I followed along with that. And had I not been lucky enough early in my practice to encounter midwives and back up home birthing, then I probably would still be practicing like where I just section breaches and section twins and not do what I was trained to do. Because of expediency and economics and medical legal concerns, it just seemed easier to do that. But I began to learn from the midwives another way of looking at birth and realized that that I was an expert in high-risk birthing and knew nothing really about physiologic normal birth, what we would call instinctual birthing. And about 85% of women don't have a medical problem assigned to take care of people that I was not an expert in, if you can think of it that way. So I began to learn from taking the midwives' transports a whole new way of doing things just by listening to them and being open enough to do it. Now, I didn't choose to go in to back up home birth midwives because I thought midwifery or home birth was a good idea. I'm sure like every other doctor coming out of training who only knows one way to practice, I probably thought home birth was stupid and I didn't know anything about midwives. But they convinced me over time to just listen to them. And I began to see that everything that I knew about obstetrics didn't apply to most women who are pregnant and that I was not an expert in normal birthing. And so after about 10 years of doing that, I started a collaborative practice with two midwives in a hospital setting, and we did really good work for about 15 years. We had really low C-section rate, about 7%. 
And we took all comers. We took preeclamptics and breaches and diabetics and twins and VBACs and everything. And the midwives did all the normal stuff and I did all the complicated stuff. And it was a great collaboration, the two styles of practice and sort of an ideal model of what you really should be. But we were never accepted in the community. We were always sort of, if for lack of a better word, we were hazed like a fraternity. We were giving tasks to complete or do that other doctors were not. We were held to a standard that other doctors were not because we made them nervous. Because we didn't do things by the book. We didn't follow every protocol. We didn't think birth was an algorithm. And we began to treat the patients as individuals. And we didn't begin to do that. That's just how we practice. And the anesthesia department, the pediatric department, they didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that moms didn't want epidurals or that our moms didn't want hepatitis vaccine or vitamin K immediately in their newborn baby. And the nurses got nervous because the nurses had only known one model of birth, and that was the medicalized model. And so after 15 years, they made it untenable for us to stay. So I left hospital-based practice in the year 2010. And for the last 12 years, I have been doing home birthing with midwives. And I'm realizing more and more that a lot of the things that we would traditionally consider high risk are not really high risk as far as the labor and delivery goes. And if the woman is stable or her condition is not a problem at the time she's in labor, then why do we alter the fact that she can labor like any other woman? We interfere in the natural process. And so I began doing type 1 diabetics at home and breaches at home and twins at home. The results are great, and I published a couple of papers on that, and uh, we're working on a third paper on twin home birthing that will come out uh, hopefully this summer. That's how I got to the point, and now I just make corrections, sort of. I've left California, I've moved to Utah, and I'm not doing clinical work right now. I was on call for 40 years. It wears on you after a while to always be on. You don't always get called, but you never know when you're going to be called, and so you're always sort of on edge. And this past year, I've been traveling around the country teaching. And it's been great. So now I advocate. I have a consultation service. I go around the country teaching breach and twin birthing. Yeah, so that's, in a nutshell, that's the crib note version of how I got to where I am right now. And I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. I'm one of those rare people that what I would consider to be a happy obstetrician. Well, it's good to love what you do. And I think a lot of people appreciate the stuff that you're providing for the birth community. And so the term breach trial that was published in 2000 like had a huge effect on vaginal breach birth and it seems really similar to the arrive trial which was published in 2020 on elective induction at 39 weeks um can you share how even though these studies have a lot of flaws like they really influence care and why do you think these studies have such a profound impact on maternal care yeah when i mentioned the term breach trial i mentioned it sort of met the model by which they wanted to practice and there's psychological things about cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias, all the economic forces are also on the side of expeditiously delivering people or doing C-sections. Because if you take a look at almost every research paper, whether it be the term breach trial or the ARRIVE trial, or any paper that's sort of accepted quickly like that, while other papers who say just the opposite are ignored, that's called confirmation bias. But, but what happens there that you can see that the only endpoint that seems to matter, guys, is a live baby in the bassinet. And how the baby gets there and the journey of the mother and the journey for the, of the mother's recovery and the journey of the mother and her future babies doesn't matter. All that matters to the obstetrician is getting a baby out that's alive. And I know that sounds harsh, but in reality, that's the truth. And you look at the endpoint in all these papers and it's neonatal death and neonatal morbidity. It's not maternal morbidity that much. It's not maternal satisfaction. It's not breastfeeding or latching or bonding or psychological well-being. None of that stuff matters. It's very, very academic and not very human. The reason that those two papers in my mind, especially I know a lot about the term breach trial, in my mind was adopted is because that's what people were looking for. Because if you look at the bulk of research on breach birth, almost every other paper, often four to 10 times larger in number of women entered into the study, say the opposite. They said there's almost no difference between vaginal or cesarean outcomes for babies who are breech. This one study, which was a small study, is the only outlier, and yet it's the one that was adopted. Same thing with the ARRIVE trial. There were many studies that came out that said that taking a PrimeMIP with an unfavorable cervix and inducing them leads to higher interventions and higher C-section rates. Suddenly, one study comes out and drops the C-section rate by 4%, and they think that this is a study that we should interfere with all of Mother Nature's design simply to get this result, which wasn't even their primary result. The primary result was to decrease injury to babies, and it didn't do that. It wasn't statistically significant. And this was a secondary result of dropping the C-section rate from 22% down to 18%. But what's really weird about that is that both of those numbers are incredibly low 
for any hospital in the country. So you have to ask yourself by looking critically at the ARRIVE paper, which no one looks at because, like I said, confirmation bias, it met the desires of the people who are practicing obstetrics in the medical model. And for people that don't understand confirmation bias, it's very, very simple. It's tied in with cognitive dissonance. It's uncomfortable to have somebody tell you something that counters your belief system. So we tend to latch on to things that support our belief system. And in other words, if you're a Republican, you watch Fox News. If you're a Democrat, you watch CNN or MSNBC. And you're uncomfortable watching the other channel. That's classically confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance. Your brain doesn't want to have that. So if doctors want to do C-sections, they're going to navigate towards something that makes their life easier. If doctors want to schedule an induction to make their life easier, that's what they're going to navigate to. And when the outcome doesn't prove them to be right or other papers come along that show that there's an alternative viewpoint and the actual decision belongs to the pregnant woman and not the institution, that's too uncomfortable. Can you imagine practicing for 30 years and doing C-sections and having a 30 or 40% C-section rate in your practice and suddenly realizing that you've been doing unnecessary surgery all those years, that's unthinkable. So no one wants to face that. So they gather toward the information that supports their position. And that's why we're at where we're at. So they had, you asked about those two papers as benchmarks for quality. They're adopted because they meet the style of care that people want to have, period. This was something that Roxanne and I had talked about with feeling confident during your pregnancy with your prenatal care and how that can support your confidence during your birth and then your confidence into parenthood. And it's like during our pregnancy, we have someone that kind of holds our hand the whole way and tells us exactly how, what decisions that we should be making for our care as opposed to informed decision making throughout our pregnancy. And then when we make it to labor, if we have a desire for a different experience then maybe our birth location is wanting to provide for us, which is ultimately like healthy mom, healthy baby, and not really too concerned with the actual experience of birth and how powerful that experience can be. And then we kind of like throw people out the hospital and tell them to go take care of their children. And then we wonder why like women sometimes feel not very confident as mothers or are confused when they're navigating their births and their preg- and their late in their parenthood journey. And it's well, their whole pregnancy, somebody told them that they knew better than them during their whole labor. Somebody was telling them they know better than them when maybe they've had different, like different opinions on things. And I'll see that sometimes when I'm supporting births in the hospital and it usually makes me not want to support births as a doula in the hospital anymore is where a family will want some something that's different than the standard of care and it's usually related to delayed cord clamping i don't know why i don't know what it is about delayed cord clamping like people just can't get on board with the delayed cord clamping and so the family will be like we want the cord to go white and to stop pulsating and they're like yeah, delayed cord clamping is our standard of care. And I'm like, define what you mean by that. And they're always like, one minute. And I'm like, that's not what they're defining it as. as. So they're defining it as white and not pulsating. And so we actually had one OB who held the baby and like would not give it to the mother until she was allowed to cut the cord. And her whole thing was that the blood will go back into the placenta. And Roxanne was at that birth and it took everything she had not to like rip the baby out of the OB's hands and place it on the mother's chest. But it was, it's things like that that gets like really frustrating supporting births in hospitals is if the client went in and was like, yes, I want to be induced at 39 weeks or I want to have a C-section for my breach. They're like, yeah, that's wonderful. Exactly. Like as long as it's exactly what the provider wants they're all about supporting it. But once you want something different, that's where all the resistance come. And like, these are things that are supported by research, like delayed core clamping. There's tons of benefits so much research. within research. And so it so like, much. it blows my mind that this study that's super flawed is the one that influences all the care when there's all these other studies that demonstrate how you can provide better care for your patients. And then those ones are not influential at all. Um, Cause they counter, like you're saying, like, what they've been doing for so long and like how dare we ask them to change their ways and I, and I don't want this to be like a an OB suck obviously <laughs> kind of conversation but it is so frustrating supporting births in the hospital can I comment on that yes yeah. okay I may have heard this story from you too about holding the baby up and saying the blood will flow out of the baby or or maybe I've heard it from somebody else I don't know if you guys ever told me about this but but that doctor's an idiot all right 
She's an idiot. She doesn't know anything. But she's so obtuse that she doesn't know she doesn't know anything. If we as a community haven't learned by now that just because someone has a degree or a bunch of letters behind their name, that doesn't make them smart or wise. And when you get gaslit all the time and you lose credibility, you'll never get it back. And the medical model of care, not just in obstetrics, but in many, many things, has lost all credibility. And I don't know why anybody trusts anybody who believes what the CDC tells them or what Big Pharma is selling them. I don't know that. I mean, the minute that you're diagnosed with hypertension, your doctor wants to put you on an antihypertensive medication and a statin, all right? And then you're basically a client of a pharmaceutical company for life. And the idea that maybe if you just exercise, lose weight, eat better, lower your stress levels, make some changes in your life, you might be able to solve a lot of that problem. The problem is there's no money in that. Nobody makes money off of that. So everything that you discussed about even the delayed cord clamping, time is money. They don't want to wait 20 minutes till the cord stops pulsating or the placenta to come out naturally. If that placenta is not out in five, six, seven minutes, they're already tugging on the cord and they're putting Pitocin in your thigh or in your IV because they have to move on. The system is designed completely not for the benefit of the client. People call patients what you and I call clients because they're not sick. It's not designed for them. It's designed to move them in and move them out. They don't have the ability like a midwife does at home, where if the placenta is not coming right now, okay, you know, I'll do some charting. I'll go wash my instruments off. I'll go do something else. And I'll just sit around and wait. I'm going to be here for two or three hours waiting around anyway. So why am I in a hurry to tug on that placenta? But in the medical model, the baby is out. The doctor wants to clamp the cord, get the placenta out, write the orders, and move on to the next task. I blame doctors for not realizing it and not fighting it, but ultimately the doctors are just pawns in the system because most doctors these days are not even self-employed. And one of the biggest problems in, in the modern medical system is having doctors as employees of large institutions because my fiduciary duty as a solo practitioner, yours as a doula being out there, is to your client. But if you as a doula are employed by the hospital, and the hospital has a policy that says everyone needs an IV, you know, everyone needs postpartum pit, and you advise your client, well, you know, you really don't need an IV, or you don't really need that pit. Do you really want that Pitocin in your leg or whatever? That gets out there, you know, the likelihood that you will not get your Christmas bonus or get fired is very high. So you have a conflict of interest as to your fiduciary duty. And again, that system is all wrong. And I don't believe, and again, uh, you know, you said you don't want to rag on obstetricians. I do. I was one of those people. I saw it and I did some of those things. I was that crazy guy dressed in the full hazmat suit who, when the baby came out with a woman up in stirrups on her back, flat on her back, you know, maybe sometimes that's valuable, but oftentimes it's a worse position, but flat on the back after we've covered them in blue drapes as if this is a sterile surgical procedure of vaginal delivery, even potentially washing off their vulva with betadine, catching the baby in my full hazmat garb clamping the cord immediately, showing the mother this beautiful thing that she just created, and then walking it across the room and setting it down in the warmer. I did that for a decade before midwives began to tell me how stupid that is. But I did it not because I was mean or evil. It's because I was sort of indoctrinated to believe that that's how you did it. And there's an old Thomas Paine saying that says the long habit of not thinking something wrong gives it the superficial appearance of being right. And people don't stop. You ask the nurse why she's taking a baby to the warmer. And she'll say something like, well, I have to check the baby out. And you go, well, why? Got to make sure the baby's okay. The baby's okay. Look at the baby. It's on mother's chest. It's pink. It's looking around. It may or may not be crying because when it's on mom's chest, there's nothing to cry about, right? They cry because they're separated from their mother often or they're being agitated, but they can't figure it out. It, it's so upsetting to them because it upsets the routine that they become comfortable with. And again, it gets back to that whole idea. We're comfortable in what we're comfortable with. I know that sounds like doesn't come out right out of my mouth, but that's the way we live. I mean, look at our shopping habits. You go to the grocery store. I mean, how often do you really try new things? If you like Skippy peanut butter, you buy Skippy peanut butter every time. You don't buy Jif. You know, if you like Charmin, you don't buy Costco toilet paper. You have patterns of behavior. And altering those patterns of behavior for many, many people is uncomfortable. And hearing me talk makes a lot of my colleagues very uncomfortable. That's why they don't want to hear what we have to say. I know how they think. They don't know how you think because they never have to hear what you think. They just dismiss it with a wave of the hand and a who's the doctor here statement. You know, where did you go to medical school? 
that sort of condescending thing that we hear all the time. It takes a really confident person to admit they don't know something. People who are not confident are often the ones that are the most adamant about doing it their way, as opposed to saying, oh, you don't want a GBS culture, or let's talk about why, let's talk about that. Okay, I guess that's your choice, right? You don't want this done. You don't want active management of the third stage. You don't want Pitocin. Why? Well, because Pitocin competes with oxytocin for my receptors on my body, and I don't want to interfere with nature's design of how when my baby comes out, I'm so in love with it that I'm putting out oxytocin, which is making my uterus contract, and it's bringing my milk let down and my colostrum let down, and my baby and I are, are bonding. No, let's just give you some artificial Pitocin because we don't want you to bleed. Not thinking of the downstream consequences of what giving artificial Pitocin, except when absolutely necessary, means. But they have an algorithm. And if they could treat every woman exactly the same, that's what they would do. I know this because I lived it. You know, I have this unique perspective because I spent 28 years in a hospital and 12 years in the home. So not very many people have had the perspective that I have. And I worked in a very high intensity hospital. I was well trained. Like I said, I was lucky. I trained in an era where things like putting forceps on and vacuums and breaches and twin deliveries vaginally and reaching up and doing a breach extraction on a second twin were taught. Those were skills that were taught. My poor colleagues don't know those skills anymore. So they're really not even skilled in the techniques that make my profession unique. You know, a taxi driver can catch a baby. A general surgeon can do a C-section. What do you need an obstetrician for? Anything that's a problem can see a maternal fetal medicine specialist if they're pregnant. They can go to a midwife, and if they have a problem, they see a MFM. If they have a problem with their bladder, they can see a GY neurologist. If they have some sort of cancer or pre-malignancy, they can see a GY oncologist. If they have... Um, fertility issues or acne or other hormonal problems, they can see a reproductive endocrinologist. The generalist OB is obsolete. They don't know it yet, but they'll find out. They'll find out. And midwifery is, you know, if people listening, they don't probably, we're sort of fellow travelers. I can't imagine there's a lot of people out there who aren't thinking like you think and like I think. But midwifery model of care is so much better for everything that you talked about, whether it's the bonding or the microbiome or the understanding of physiology or the future generations. I mean, we've sterilized birth to the point where we've scared three generations of women to think that their bodies don't work. They need us to rescue them. And we've sterilized death as well. Most people go through life never seeing someone born and never seeing someone die. Think about that for a second. Everybody's born. Everybody dies. Most people have never seen it. Is that weird? My first birth was my own. I mean, now I've, I've seen quite a few for, as a doula. But the very first birth that I experienced was my own birth. And I think that's the experience for a lot of people is their first experience with bringing life into the world is their own. And I think it's also different. You mean giving birth? You mean giving birth, right, Gina? Yeah, like giving birth was my first birth experience. Oh, I mean, yeah, like me giving birth. I don't remember when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but me neither. So what is the concern with a vaginal breech birth? Like, what are the risks of it? Like, the things that I've always been told is not having a skilled provider is what makes it dangerous. That's true. Breech birth used to be, like I said, considered just a normal variation. And doctors were skilled. And breech births, they're fun to do, actually, if you're not frightened to death of it. Because as a breech baby comes out, it signals to you by its rotation and its movement and its tone and its color whether it's doing great or it needs help. Breech births vaginally succeed or not for the same reason that head down babies succeed or not. Some labors stall out. Some babies get into distress. But at no greater frequency that's detectable than a head down baby. Let me give you some numbers. If you take a baby and you deliver a breech baby at 39 weeks with a scheduled C-section, first of all, when you schedule a C-section on a woman, you're not giving the baby the benefit of picking its own birthday and experiencing the labor and the hormonal cocktail with mom and possibly exposed to the microbiome of the vagina. You're taking all that away. But again, that's not part of the equation. Remember, all that matters to the modern obstetrician is a live baby in the bassinet. I'll keep repeating that. But if you section all those babies who are breached, you're going to have a, a neonatal mortality rate of about one in 2,000. And if you let babies deliver vaginally who are term breech, we're talking about term breech, skilled practitioner, the risk is about one in 500. So you're talking about a four times greater risk with a vaginal breech birth than a cesarean for breech birth. But you're not discussing any of the benefits, but let's take a look at what numbers really mean. 
because the risk with a head down vaginal delivery of a neonatal death is about one in a thousand. And I'm rounding these numbers for math. Okay. So a vaginal breech birth is twice as risky as a vaginal head down birth. But if I told you that, that sounds like I don't want to take that risk. But what if I told you the opposite? What if I told you the chance of not having a terrible outcome with a breech baby born by cesarean section is 99.95%. And with a head down baby, it's 99.9%. And with a breech baby, it's 99.8% of not having a bad outcome. How many people think there's a big difference between 99.8% and 99.9 or 99.95%? That's a four times difference. But when you put it in actual risk, it's quite small. So we're sectioning all these babies and we're telling people all these dangerous things, not because it's dangerous, but because doctors have been convinced or taught that it's dangerous. They fear it. And then they take their own fear and they project it on the population at large. And that's where we are today. The fear is, oh, the cord will prolapse or the head will get stuck. Yeah, that can happen. But we have babies born head down that have terrible shoulder dystocias. Most newborn intensive care units, when you're talking about term babies, I'm talking about the extreme preemies or the babies with anomalies. But if you look at neonatal intensive care units, they're often filled, not filled, but they often have a lot of babies in them that came into the hospital with their mother, inside their mother, in perfect condition with a head down labor. And somehow, they ended up in the NICU. And no one blames the hospital model for that. But if a woman comes from home, or there's a breech birth that ends up in the NICU, oh my God, you're a bad doctor, you're a bad mother, you're a bad, you know, why? There's no guarantee. And the beauty of the midwifery model is that midwives accept uncertainty. And we let our clients know that because the model allows us the time to talk about it. Doctors, they don't trust birth, they fear birth, and they hate uncertainty. So they try to control everything. And if anything life has taught me, is the more you try to control something, the more you mess it up. And just look at life in general. Look at banking. Look at the food industry. Look at anything. They try to control it and they just they screw it up. It's the same thing here. The lessons in birthing are lessons in life. And if you can learn from either one of them. So they fear breach birth because they don't understand it. They don't know how to do it. For those of us that practice it, again, like I said, succeeds or fails for the very same reason that head down babies succeed or fail. You don't end up with this sudden emergency very, very often in the home birthing world because we're not messing with Mother Nature's design. Hospitals often will have babies that will have fetal intolerance to labor or have an emergency C-section because the heart rate drops. But then you look back at their chart and they've been starved for 20 hours. They've been immobilized. They've been numbed with an epidural for 12 hours. They've been hyperstimulated with Pitocin for eight hours. And the baby finally just like pooped out. Who, would, who blames a baby for pooping out at that point? It's been disconnected from its mother. It's been stressed out, and finally it, it gives out, and, they, and then they say, you know, they do an emergency C-section on you, and they say, wow, thank God you were in the hospital. What would have happened if this had happened to you at home? Not understanding that these things almost never happen at home because we don't do all the things that you just did to cause this to happen in the first place. And if I said that to them, I would, be, I would have eyes rolling and scoffing and laughing because they don't understand birth. I didn't either. I was them, and I got lucky and I escaped. I mean, there are true emergencies where a woman can have a placental abruption, not from Pitocin or Cytotec, or a woman can have a placenta previa, or you can have a cord prolapse from polyhydramnios and the membranes rupture and wash the cord out. That's all really true. The thing about it is, is that you ask some woman who's had an emergency C-section, she comes in for a history, she's looking for a VBAC, and she says, yeah, my, I had to have an emergency C-section with my first pregnancy. But what I always love is when the doctor told them they had an emergency C-section, and I said, to, I say to them, from the time they decided you needed a C-section until the baby was out, how long was that? And they'll go, oh, it took about an hour, okay? Well, if it took an hour, it's not an emergency C-section, okay? But that's what you'll hear. And there's a disconnect that the patient doesn't see it because they don't realize what they're saying. A true emergency C-section is like when everybody's panicking. And they're running you down the hall in the bed and they throw you on the other bed and they gas you and they do a crash C-section. Those are very rare. A lot of times they'll be for a fetal intolerance to overstimulation of the labor. And they'll say, we need to do a C-section. Now they'll turn off the pit and then the contraction space out, the baby gets better. And then they do the C-section and they still say it was an emergency C-section. So it's very difficult for the average consumer to know who to trust or what to trust. You've got to put more effort into finding the right practitioner for your birth. Treat your birth as a life event and not a medical event. And don't just look at your insurance card or a book of providers 
or just because some person has been doing your pap smear for 10 years, that that person is now going to catch your baby. You want to find out a little bit more about them. You want to interview different people. You want to interview midwives. If the people from the Down to Birth podcast, which I love, we did a, a podcast with them last year. It was about red flags. And one of them I really loved, and that's when if you go to see your OB or your midwife for that matter, you're always a little anxious as a pregnant woman going in for a doctor's appointment. It's exciting, but it's also anxiety provoking. When you walk out back to your car to go home, ask yourself, how do you feel? Do you feel reassured and happy or do you feel worse? And if you ever walk out of your doctor's office consistently and feel worse, then wake up, change practitioners. That's not how it's supposed to be. You should find someone that makes you feel safe because when you feel safe, you're far more likely to have a successful pregnancy and labor than when you're living in fear all the time. And we have a problem list. We have a medical model that looks at birth as a problem. I'll give you a perfect example of this that they caught about three years ago. When you take a history, the way you're taught to take a history is you, somebody comes in, you ask them what their chief complaint is, and then you take a history on that. And then you go through meds and allergies and past medical history and past surgical history and family history and review of systems. And that's sort of how you take a history. For all my career, I had been going through that. And when we got to past medical history, she came in for a consult. I don't know if it was for breach or just pregnancy in general or whatever. And I said to her, like I've said a thousand times or 10,000 times, do you have any other medical problems? And she looked at me and she goes, what's the first one? And I thought for a second, do you have any other medical problems? The number one problem I've been thinking all these years, is, it was ingrained into me was pregnancy. That pregnancy is the number one medical problem. But pregnancy isn't a medical problem. And we have to stop thinking of it that way. Pregnancy can develop medical problems like preeclampsia or diabetes or other problems or hypertension or growth restriction or a bunch of other things. But pregnancy in and of itself isn't a medical problem, yet the medical model sees pregnancy that way. And so for, at your very first visit, they'll plant these seeds of doubt. Like, we know, you're over 35, so your placenta might get older, so we're going to have to start watching your baby closely when you get in the third trimester. Or, you know, you're only five foot two and your husband's six foot five, we've got to make sure you don't grow a big baby. And they'll just throw this stuff out there. What the F are they doing? Why are you doing that? And all they're doing really is projecting their own anxieties upon the women they care for. And then they're calling it care. It's not care. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Let's take a break from this week's episode to hear about our sponsors. Crossover Symmetry offers world-class training and equipment for pain, fitness, and performance. We have a Crossover Symmetry shoulder system on every power rack in our gym because it has been so beneficial for our perinatal clients to support their shoulder health. Crossover Symmetry provides shoulder bands with several types of attachments, such as a door anchor for home or travel use, squat rack attachments, and also wall mounts. In addition to their equipment, Crossover Symmetry offers training programs to guide you to strong, pain-free shoulders and even a four-week postpartum program created by yours truly. Crossover Symmetry is our chosen brand in the gym, and we recommend them to all our clients. Check them out at crossoversymmetry.com and use code MAMASTAYFIT for 20% off your own system. Needed is a nutrition company focused on providing optimal nourishment for the perinatal journey. Did you know that during pregnancy, you need upwards of 100 grams of protein a day to support your pregnancy? The type of protein you consume also matters. Collagen is an optimal form of protein for pregnancy. It has the right amino acids to support skin stretching as your belly grows, as well as recovery from birth, whether vaginal or cesarean. Most of us don't consume enough collagen in our diet, and this is where a high quality supplement comes in. Needed makes my favorite collagen protein for the perinatal stage. Needed's collagen is also third body tested for heavy metals, which is important for any supplement you are consuming during pregnancy and postpartum. To get started with Needed's collagen, head to thisisneeded.com and use code MAMASTAYPOD for 20% off your first three months of Needed. So we're always talking about like the risks of like vaginal breech birth. Like what are the risks of a cesarean birth for breech? Because I, I, I don't really ever see that side of the conversation. So when my clients go in for like a VBAC consult, like the only risk is like the risk of having a vaginal birth after cesarean, but nobody talked to them when they had their first C-section on the risks of having that C-section in regards to how it was going to affect like future births as well, like future conception, future pregnancies, future labors. So could you talk about like, what are the risks of a C-section for vag or for breech positioning? The American College of OBGYN in their revised breech guidelines talks about vaginal breech birth may be a reasonable option under hospital-specific protocol guidelines with a skilled practitioner. Now, obviously, they don't support home birthing, home breech delivery, because they don't support home anything. But part of their thing also says that they must advise people of the greater risk to vaginal breech birth over cesarean breech birth. 
But there's nothing in their guidelines that talk about the risks of cesarean birth. Just like you said, it's sort of ignored. The British guidelines, which are called the Royal College of OBGYN and Greentop Guidelines from 2017, they do mention that there's greater risks to the mother from the cesarean section, which includes the VBAC, the risk of uterine rupture, and the risk of abnormal placentation, which is where you could get something called placenta accreta. And every time you have a C-section, you increase your risk of the placenta growing into the uterus and then not being able to be separated afterwards, which can lead to immense blood loss, possibly even cesarean hysterectomy. And in rare cases when you're in a very rural area or a poor area, you know, there's a higher maternal mortality from that. I don't want to use scare tactics and say that even though these numbers are higher, they're not that high. You should be giving informed consent. You should be giving informed. If you're going to accent the risks of breech birth vaginally, which we just talked about was 99.8 versus 99.95 of it not happening, then you also need to talk about those risks. And so one of them is that you have a scarred uterus and now you have a risk of the scar separating. And that, you know, that's a small risk of uterine rupture causing damage to the baby. That's not a very big risk. It's about one in a thousand, one in 1,200 women who undergo a VBAC will end up with a baby that has a really bad outcome. And by bad outcome, I mean really bad outcome, like death or brain damage. So you're putting that woman and her future babies at risk. I'm going to digress for a second. And, you know, another thing that I ask women when they come in for a breach consult with me, especially primips, when they've been told that they need to have a C-section, is I ask them, did your doctor ever ask you if you want more children? And the answer is universally no, the doctor never asked that question. Because remember, all that doctor's thinking about is what? A live baby in the bassinet. He's not thinking about that woman's future babies or her future pregnancies. He's not, he's not thinking about that. So obviously, there's no counseling, as you said, when a C-section is recommended, there's no counseling about what, what the downstream consequences of that are. And that doesn't even get into the microbiome and the long short-term effects on a newborn baby and the mother's future babies. And it doesn't get into the risk of slower recovery and the possibility of more pain and worse bonding and maybe scar tissue and maybe future bowel obstruction or bladder problems because of the surgery. Those things are really not mentioned. A woman's body is designed to give birth vaginally. And yes, vaginal deliveries can cause trauma. You can have tears, you can have tears into the rectum, you could have pelvic floor damage, uh, nerve damage from a vaginal delivery. Yes, that, that can happen, but that's nature's design. Whenever you interfere with nature's design, you're adding in a whole bunch of other downsides and risk factors, and those things are not discussed. And as you said, it's not benign. A C-section is not a benign procedure. It carries risk. It carries risk of transfusion from extra blood loss. So there's lots of downstream consequences to having a cesarean section. And women should be given true informed consent. And they can't be given true informed consent by someone who just tells them that breach is dangerous and your baby's head will get stuck. And the reason that that happens is a lot of times in premature babies, it can happen more commonly because the body is smaller than the head and the body can fall. But at term, what happens is women will inevitably show up at the hospital with the feet or the butt sticking out of the woman's vagina and nobody will know what to do and people will end up starting to pull on the baby and they don't know what to do. So they'll either try to shove the baby back up or pull on the baby. And those are the things that can cause problems. If you don't know your basic cardinal movements of a breach and how to resolve a baby that's hung up, then yeah, you, a cesarean section is all you have. Like I said, there's all kinds of problems downstream with that. The choice belongs to the informed woman. And if the choice is taken away because residency programs aren't teaching anymore and malpractice carriers and hospitals are banning it, that's a system that it's failed the women we're supposed to be taking care of. So are there different types of brief positionings and are there any like contraindications to like certain types of positions? So I've been told like footling is like not a good vaginal breach position because of cord prolapse. I think I've heard you said somewhere where like footling is not as common as we think it is. So could you explain like the different types of positions if there's any like specific risk to like a certain type of positioning or is it all kind of the same? No, no, there are, there are differences. The most common type of breach is called frank breach and that's where the baby's feet are up by the baby's head. So that means that the hips are flexed and the knees are extended. And the baby's in, in what we would consider the diving pike position. If you ever watch the Olympics, somebody who's diving, where well, they grab their ankles and they do somersaults by holding onto their ankles, that sort of thing. That's the most common. The second most common is complete breach. And that's where the baby's sitting cross-legged or Indian style, or you know, it might have one leg folded underneath it, one leg up by the chest, maybe called incomplete breach or complete breach. Those forms of breach are the most common at term. Now, a baby that has complete breach, when a woman's in labor and she starts to get close to pushing or starts to push, a foot might come out. 
And that's why the term footling is a mistake because people see a foot and they automatically assume footling. But the footling breach is the opposite of a frank breach. It's where the hips and legs are both extended. So the baby's essentially standing up. And at term, it's almost impossible because there's just not room for a baby to do that. With premature babies or second twins, you can sometimes see a true footling breach. But with a term breach presentation, you're not going to see that very often. The incidence of cord prolapse in a head down baby is about one in 500 births. In a breech baby, it's about one in 250 births. And it's more common in complete and incomplete breaches than with frank breach. But in most cases, a cord prolapse, if it's a head down baby or a frank breach, is an emergency. If that happens, because the cord can get compressed. And so if that happens in the hospital, they're going to elevate, or at home, you're going to put a woman in knee chest position, you're going to elevate the head, you're going to take her down the hall to do a C section unless delivery is imminent and you can help the baby out, whether it's head down or breach. And there are maneuvers to do that. But if you can't, then that C section is necessary. When you have a baby that's incomplete breach or complete breach and the cord falls out, that's scary as shit, but the cord generally doesn't get compressed. So you, the baby may be just fine. And so you have time to either finish the delivery if she's completely dilated by doing a breech extraction or take, going to the operating room and doing a cesarean section. You know, cord prolapse is considered an obstetrical emergency, but it isn't always an emergency with breech birth, but it's always scary for the practitioner to deal with that. So that's an honest concern. But if a baby is in the pelvis, like when you have a head down baby, and there isn't polyhydramnios, or head, it's not an unstable lie where the baby's floating around, the woman's had an ultrasound recently and there's no cord down there, the likelihood of a cord prolapse is really small. As I said, it's one in 500 head down bursts, one in 250 breech bursts. Are you going to section all 250 breaches because you might have one cord prolapse? I mean, there are some people who would say, yeah, but then they're not looking at what we just talked about and you asked the question about before, the risks of cesarean to this baby, this mother, and the mother's future babies. So to section all breaches is ethically inappropriate and medically inappropriate. To teach doctors and midwives how to do breach is our duty, and that's what we should be doing. I, for one, love complete breaches for a couple reasons. One is it's always cute when a foot pops out. It's very cute, okay? I mean, you've seen the pictures on Instagram where it's just a foot sticking out between the labia. It's really cute. I mean, it, you know, it makes people crap in their pants if they don't know anything about breach birth. But if the butt is right up behind it, then having the legs down like that, if the baby for some reason were to get in trouble and she's completely dilated, you have a handle. You can actually grab the legs and pull the baby out. Whereas with a head down baby, when you're at home with a head down baby or even at the hospital with a head down baby, and maybe it's a little too high to put a vacuum on or you don't have that option at home, you can't grab onto that. There's nothing you can grab onto. You have to either do an emergency C-section, put a vacuum on or intense fundal pressure or something to try to get that baby out because you now have this terminal bradycardia because the cord is down or something like that. But with a breach, especially a complete breach, you got handles. And again, this is what we teach at the course. We teach what to do in this situation. We teach what to do if you have breech twins. I just go off on a tangent for a second. And as if I haven't scolded my colleagues enough, I'm going to scold them one more time. And that's, if you're not comfortable doing breech birth, and you have a client who's breech, and, and you don't find out till 37 weeks or 38 weeks, and you have a relationship with that client, and you tell her, listen, I only know how to do cesarean for breech. You know, an ethical thing would be to do, there's a doctor across town that does vaginal breech birth. You should go talk to that person and then come back and talk to me and we'll talk about it. And if you choose to have a C-section with me, that's great. That's ethical. That's honorable to do that. But if you're not comfortable with breech birthing and you find out at 10 weeks or 12 weeks that your client is having twins, then why are you taking care of that woman? Because more than 50% of all twins at term will have at least one of the babies being breech position. First baby, second baby, both babies. So if you don't do breach delivery and more than half of twins have a breach in them at term, you're not an expert in twin birthing. Why are you claiming to be an expert in twin birthing? Why are you saying, we'll just schedule your C-section for 37 weeks? Why are you saying that? That is absolutely unethical. And I can guarantee you that my colleagues don't think of it as being that way because they've never thought of outside their little box. They think they're doing what's right because they think that breaches is dangerous and sectioning all breaches makes sense. Because that's what they've been taught for 20 some years. And we've got a whole generation of doctors out there who don't know how to do, don't have these skills. And the people like me who have them, most of them gave it up anyway because the term breach trial came along and their hospital or their partnership or whatever else said, we're not doing breaches anymore. So even if they wanted to offer it, they don't have the option to offer it anymore. And only those of us that are, to quote my friend Elliot Berlin in the Heads Up Breach documentary, we're dying off 
and eventually there'll be nobody left. That's why I love midwives so much because midwives have the intellectual curiosity and the desire to meet the needs of their clients that they're the ones that are the torchbearers of these skills. And they're taking it over from obstetricians who used to be truly skilled practitioners. And now they're, they're not. They're smart. They know diseases really well, but their hands-on stuff is lacking. And the, you can't solve all problems with a scalpel because it creates a whole new set of problems. Yeah. I never even thought about the twins thing where like a lot of providers, if they know you're having twins and they're like, oh, well, you can attempt vaginal birth if both babies are head down. And you're like- Yeah, more than half. But like so many of them are breech. What do you mean? Like, well, yeah, well, if one of them flips breech, C-section. I'm like, so many babies- our breach. Right. Because I teach on this, I know the statistics in the, in the um, general population, and I know that more than half of twins will have at least one baby be breached. But they will. They'll say, well, you can, we'll allow you to have a vaginal delivery if they're both head down. Well, you know, and I know that word allow is something that should never be in our vocabulary anymore. It's not our position to ever tell someone what they're allowed to do. Our fiduciary duty and our ethical obligation is to give women choices. There's three stages of informed consent. There's a subjective and objective and a support phase. You know, objective is you give facts. Subjective is you give your opinion. And then support is supporting your client, even if she chooses to go in a direction that you yourself wouldn't go. That's our obligation. And one of the, and your support could look like, listen, I'm not comfortable with breach delivery. You want a vaginal breach delivery? I'm not your guy. And that's really ethical. It's not ethical to tell them that, you know, the head will get stuck, the cord will fall out, and you'd be a fool to have a breach vaginal birth. That's what you hear, but that's not ethical in any way, shape, or form, because it's not even true. And even if it was a greater risk, the question is, who gets to decide what risk means? Because there's a basic tenet of medical ethics, guys, that says, given the same information, it's not reasonable to expect two people to come to the same conclusion. Because of the differences in life experience of people, and because of prognostic uncertainty, we should never be expecting people to follow our guidelines. We should give them our best information, Try to keep bias out of it, but understand that everyone has a bias, and it's impossible to eliminate bias. So be open and honest about your bias when you're talking, and give people the option of a second opinion. If you're uncomfortable with their decision, say, listen, I'm uncomfortable with your decision. I'm here to support you, and I'll give you my 100% of my best effort, but maybe you might want to talk to this guy over here or that woman over there and see if maybe that's a better fit for you. I mean... Doctors have the right to have their opinions and fears and decisions honored, too. But ultimately, the patient has the ultimate say. It's not a complicated ethical dilemma. And by the way, if you're ever at a hospital and you feel like you're getting bullied or feel like you're getting pressured, they want to give your baby vitamin K. It's a dumb example. but And you don't want to give it. You want to give it oral. And they don't do oral in the hospital. They only do int- uh, intramuscular. And they can say, you know, well, we, we want your baby to have this. And, we, and you feel like there's a confrontation coming. You can stop them in their tracks and say, listen, I hear what you're saying. I would like an ethics consult right now. And by mandate, every hospital has to offer you an ethics consult. So it's a great way to diffuse a situation which seems like it's getting really intense, that there's a conflict between you and the practitioner or you and the nurses. And you can always fire your practitioner. and You can always fire your nurses in labor. People don't know that. They can It's never easy to do that. That's why you want to try to make all these great decisions way, way before before you're even pregnant. You want to do some research into your community and who's good at this and who's good at that, who thinks like you do. And it's really important to remember that for some women, the thought of delivering vaginally is a bridge they just do not want to cross, and a cesarean section is a godsend for them. And that's fine, as long as they've been given the information. Or even if they don't want to hear the information, if that's their choice. But for other women, giving birth vaginally is a life event of immense meaning. And to take that away from them, because you're scared of breach birth, you the doctor, is just wrong. It's wrong. And the people that really need to come around on this are the people that run the residency programs. I don't know what's wrong with these people. You're training people to be obstetricians, and they're not skilled in something that makes our, that defines our profession which makes it unique. You know, I I was talking the other day, I think I was talking to Nathan Riley. I don't know if you know who Nathan is, but I was on a podcast of his and I started to do the math in my head and know about 3% of term pregnancies are breach and about 3% are twins. So that's 6%. And half of twins will have a breach. So that's about 4.5%. So that's about one in 20 to one in 25. Okay. So one out of every 20 women that come into your care 
are going to have a breech baby involved in it. And you're not an expert in that. And you're claiming to be an expert in obstetrics. And you can't care for one in 20 people. How many people with a thyroid disorder can an endocrinologist not take care of? None. Takes care of all of them. You're a specialist in obstetrics. And one out of every 20 people that walk into your office, you can't take care of. I feel bad for them, my colleagues who didn't get trained in this. Because you're supposed to be an expert. And an expert isn't telling someone information to skew them down a path that you want them to take because it's all you know or it's all you're comfortable with or it's all your practice allows or your hospital allows. That's wrong. And again, it takes a very strong person to stand up to that and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And if you look at any doctor who's gone outside the norms like me or like Nathan or like Victoria Flores, who I work with, or you know a few other people around the country, all of us, David Hayes, we all have the same sort of story. Either the hospitals got rid of us or we couldn't ethically stay in the hospital system that was doing things to women that we thought was, was wrong. And when we raised our hand up, we got hammered. You know, there's an old Japanese proverb about what do you do with a nail that stands out and you pound it back in again. And so conformity is what the big system likes. The big system doesn't like individuality. And yet birthing is not like having your appendix out. Birthing is a life experience. We need to stop thinking of it as a medical thing where you take out your insurance card. As I said earlier, go to the person who's been doing your pap smear for 10 years. You know, Bliss has this thing about weddings, and you probably heard the analogy. We spend thousands of dollars on our wedding, and we plan everything from the color of the napkins, to the flowers, to the dress, to who we invite, to the invitations, to the food. Birth is a life event probably of greater, equal or greater proportion than marriages, because a lot of marriages don't end up lasting. But you're the mother of your child for your entire life, and you remember the day that you're at birth to your baby your entire life. And we relegate that to a third party payer. So imagine if you did that with your wedding. You know, you didn't have to pay for your wedding because you had insurance for it, but they picked the church, they picked the rabbi or the priest, they invited people to your wedding you don't like, they picked out a food that you don't like. You couldn't have the chocolate cake, you could only have the white cake. You know, you would never go for something like that for your wedding. Right. But we do it for our birth. I love the fact that my Bliss and, and Alex and the people from the sanctuary taught me so much. That, you know, it's a struggle sometimes, not for me anymore, but when I was still working in the hospital and I knew this, it was really conflicted. You know, it was like the little devil on this shoulder and little angel on this shoulder. They're like talking into one ear or the other ear and it's like your head starts to spin around because you see things like you said earlier, you rather do home births only because as a doula, you go to the hospital and you watch stuff going on that you know is wrong. You know, my friend Lindsay, who was a midwife, she used to be a labor and delivery nurse. And she said, I would work there and I I felt like I was witness to the scene of a crime. Every time, every day at work, I would see things that just made me sick because you know they're wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it in that system. Uh, You know, I go off on lots of tangents when I talk about this stuff because I'm very passionate about it. But breech birth is a variation of normal. If you have a breech birth, there are certain criteria that make it safe. I can rattle them off really quickly. There are nine that I use for home birthing. Term. Frank or complete breach, estimated fetal weight between five and nine and a half to 10 pounds. I would never tell a woman who's got a 10 pound baby that she can't have a trial of labor, just like with a head down baby. In our model, we wouldn't do that. Because again, estimated fetal weight outside of the uterus is so awful and wrong so often. So those three things, uh, a flexed head, no gross anomalies, a maternal pelvis that isn't been sort of congenitally abnormal or been crushed in an accident. The pelvis is a dynamic organ. People think the pelvis is fixed bones like your forearm or something like that. It's not. It's got lots of ligaments and joints in between it that move. So you don't look at somebody and say, oh, you have small hips. You can't have a... And we used to do something called x-ray pelvimetry, where we'd actually take women upstairs in labor and we'd do an x-ray of them. And we'd take out our ruler and we'd measure measurements. And if they were off by half a centimeter, they ended up having to have a C-section, not realizing how stupid that is because we're taking an x-ray with them laying flat on their back, which is the worst position you could possibly be in to have openings to your pelvis. Your pelvis is much more open when you're squatting or when you're on all fours. Seven is labor has to start spontaneously. Eight is that obviously mom and baby need to tolerate labor. And the ninth one is that thing that we all as home birth workers know is that the family and the parents have to have the right mindset for having an out-of-hospital birth. You can't take someone who is planning a hospital birth with a head down baby who finds out at 38 weeks they're breech and then suddenly become, you know, not only are they breech, but now they're going to have a home birth with a breech. Sometimes that's not the right fit. So sometimes it is, and sometimes it works, and it worked really well for many of my clients who were planning hospital births, and then when they were faced with a cesarean, they were able to switch over, but they had to have the right mindset in the first place. It's very difficult to take somebody who is fearful of home birthing and then tell them they're going to have a home birth. That's not going to work either. 
But if they don't meet those criteria, if the baby's got a congenital problem with its neck and its head is tilted backwards or it's got a goiter, or if the baby has an anomaly like a abdominal wall defect or spina bifida, baby's not tolerating labor. Those are obvious reasons why a C-section is the right thing to do. And maybe that's 10 or 15% of the time. I mean, my own personal success rate, and again, my numbers don't reach statistical significance because I don't have big enough numbers to do that. If you understand statistics, you understand why. But my success rate with multiparous women, with their, which are women that have already had at least one vaginal birth, with a properly selected breach at term is 100%. It won't always be 100%, but it's 100%. And with my first-time moms, it's 80%. So if you extrapolate that out, if a person sections all breaches as, a, as an obstetrician, 100% of the time they're doing it on a multip, it's wrong. And 80% of the time, they're doing an unnecessary cesarean section on a primate. That's crazy. Yeah, usually the only option that my clients will get if their babies are breech is um, to have an ECV. And and then some of them, like, they won't even be offered an ECV because the provider has said there's some sort of risk. So usually, like, my VBAC clients, if the placenta's on the front or sometimes the reason why the provider will say they can't do an ECV. Are there any like contraindications to like ECVs? Like, is that like a good option for somebody who potentially doesn't have a vaginal breach option in their area or with their provider? And what are the risks of an ECV? Well, there's only two reasons to do an ECV. One is that you have no options otherwise. And one is because finding a, another practitioner sometimes can be an expense that people can't afford. If they have to hire me for a breach delivery, that was thousands of dollars out of their pocket. Whereas if they had a successful ECV, they could stick with their hospital birth or their midwife home birth plan and they wouldn't need to hire me. But if if they're okay with having a vaginal breach birth, then there's no reason to do an ECV. That's external cephalic version is what it stands for. As far as contraindications, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of contraindications. Obviously, if someone's in labor, probably not a good choice to do. If someone's bleeding unexplained, you wouldn't do it. What makes it harder is a first-time mom, frank breach position a mom that's physically fit, an anterior placenta, low amniotic fluid around the baby. Pretty much those are the main things that make it harder, but they're not contraindications. But the success rate in primips who are physically fit and stuff like that is pretty small, maybe 20 or 30%, if that high at all. And then by doing it, they want to do it at 37 or 38 weeks because that's when the baby's only going to continue to grow and the fluid's only going to continue to diminish. So they think there's the best chance of doing it. The problem, of course, is that if you didn't do it, maybe the baby would have flipped on its own anyway, if you just waited. So it's a moderately invasive procedure. It doesn't carry a lot of risk, but the hospitals, of course, manage everything as if they're, you're about to explode. So they'll want to do it in the hospital with an anesthesiologist standing by, possibly with an epidural in place and giving you an IV interbutylene. And it's a very medicalized procedure. And when you do it that way, you know, the woman is completely stressed out. And again, it's very hard to relax. And it's very, and it, so the success rates, I think, are not going to be very high. But they do it that way anyway. You know, it's good to have that option, but it's a horrible option to have in lieu of the fact that breech birth should be offered. Yeah, if that's your only option, then, you know, it's reasonable. But then you also want to assess the motivation and the skill of the person doing it. And how do you assess that? You could ask your doctor, you know, what's your success rated version? Well, that's irrelevant. Because first of all, you don't know they're going to tell you the truth. And secondly, your particular circumstance is different than someone else's circumstance. He may have a high success rate on multips. And she may have a low success rate on primips, and you're a primip. And you ask what your success rate is, you should specify. You know, on first time moms who crossfit, our babies are frank breach, what's your success rate? They may or may not know. And, they may, and their motivation to have the baby turn might not be very high. They may be happy to schedule your C section on a Tuesday morning at 7 30 and turn the baby and then have to deal with you in labor at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night. And I know that sounds harsh, but that's part of the medical system that we put in place is that money and expediency and economics and all that stuff does dictate how things are done. You know, people, it's an ugly fact, but people can't, you know, just because it's ugly doesn't mean you don't have to look at it. And honestly, if doctors could do all their babies delivered at 7.30 in the morning on a weekday, they'd pick that in a heartbeat. It's convenient. Right. It's totally convenient. I mean, they thought of bringing in laborists, which are guys that are working a shift for 12 hours or 24 hours at a hospital, would lower the C-section rate. Because they'd take away the pressure of doctors to have to get to the office or get home for dinner or do their kids' baseball game or whatever else. You know, you've been pushing for two hours, now I'm going to do your C-section. If you have a doctor in the hospital that's just sitting around in the lounge hanging out waiting, what difference does it make if you're pushing for an hour, two hours, three hours, you know, or your labor's taking too long, that sort of thing. There's no, they thought that that would be a good idea. But of course, that's stage one thinking. 
Stage one thinking is thinking something sounds good, but actually trying to figure out whether it actually does good. Because what they actually found out was that the C-section rates of laborists varied from like 10% to 70%, depending on the laborist. So the laborist brings their own skills and bias to their thing. So if they think that a C-section is indicated because there's a little blip on the continuous fetal monitoring, which of course is another topic altogether, they're going to section you. And if another doctor is much more patient, then he's going to have a lower C-section rate. So the laborist didn't change anything about the C-section rate, which is plateaued in the United States at around 31.5%, which for Western countries is better than many, but still horrible. The World Health Organization organization I'm not a fan of, obviously, but they think that the C-section rate should be 10 to 15% in Western countries. And the fact is, it's, you know, it's over 30%. And in some countries like Brazil and South Africa and Armenia, you're talking like 70% C-section rates. Think about that for a second. Do you actually believe that seven out of 10 women can't give birth as nature designed? If the World Health Organization sees the C-section rate should be 15%, and we're doing, say we're doing 30% C-section rate, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that means that half of all the C-sections being done are probably not necessary. So if we have 1.3 million cesarean sections being done every year in the United States, by far the most common operation, that means there's six to 700,000 unnecessary surgeries being done every single year in the United States. Think about that. If there were 600,000 unnecessary knee surgeries or mastectomies, people would be in an outrage and, and insurance companies would be in an outrage because they're paying for unnecessary surgery. Yet there's not a peep about reconciling the World Health Organization's information with what's actually happening. That's crazy. But here's the really scary part, and maybe you've heard me say this before. If half of all the C-sections being done are unnecessary based on the WHO, who's doing them? Because no doctor goes home at night and says to their spouse, hey, honey, guess what? I did two unnecessary C-sections today. Every C-section a doctor does, whether it's for breach or anything else, he believes is necessary, he or she. Yet half are unnecessary. So therein lies cognitive dissonance. If half of all C-sections are unnecessary and you are never doing them, who's doing them? Well, it's the other guy. But what's the other guy saying? The other guy's pointing at you and saying you're doing them. And no one's taking responsibility for the fact that 600,000 unnecessary women are undergoing unnecessary surgery every year. And for whatever reason, women and maternity care, especially women of color and stuff, they're so low on the priority list. 600,000 men were having unnecessary prostate surgery which probably a lot are, but many, well, many probably are anyway, but there would be an uproar. There would be an uproar. There's no question about it. There's a misogynistic, paternalistic culture. And by the way, when I say misogyny and paternalism, I don't necessarily mean that that's perpetrated by men because women OBs can be just as mean and just as harsh and just as obtuse as men physicians can. So it's the system itself that carries with it a lot, lots of shame and problems. And they just, and no one's taking a look at it because those that run the system are having a good time. They're fine with it because they're in power and they're making money. You know, they control everything. So for them, it's working just fine. But for a pregnant woman, are you the consumer? Are you the physician? Are you the labor and delivery nurse? It really isn't working just fine. But we all feel powerless to change it. And it's just easier to keep our head down and go home to our family, you know, and keep our job than it is to speak out. Because those that speak out end up, like I said, getting pounded on. I'm so happy the last 10 years, other than being on call and, and that sort of thing, which wore me out after 40 years. I loved the relationships I developed with the clients over the last 12 years of doing home birthing and doing breach delivery and offering these services to people and giving them a choice. Every time I say something, I want to slap myself in the face because when I say going into medicine, I think of pregnancy in a different category. Pregnancy can become a medical problem, but as I said earlier, it's not. It's nurturing a normal function of the body. Well, we really appreciate you chatting with us today. We definitely dived into a lot of different amazing topics. And thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. You know, I feel like a broken record because I talked about this a lot, but I realize that I'm reaching different audiences when I do this. And things are spreading. There's no question, yes, like Bliss and I in my podcast, we're a lightning rod for stories of people with successes or trauma or whatever. They send us, we get emails and letters and Instagram messaging all the time. But I'm sensing more stories coming that, that about a successful breech birth here or a successful twin birth here, or we traveled from North Carolina to Virginia in order to get the birth that we wanted. And when we hear those kind of stories, it makes us feel really good. Because even though we're a small fraction of the birth world, we're changing lives and we're changing the next generation. And again, it's so important. When I see pictures of a woman giving birth, a water birth, with her other children around her, it's so heartwarming to me because those children 
will have less fear of birth. And not that they should have no fear, but they'll have less fear of birth. They'll see it as a normal part of life. They'll look at it completely differently than the majority of the population who thinks immediately when they're pregnant that they've got to have a medical doctor and they've got to go to the hospital and they've got to have an epidural, you know, have all these shots. And that's how they think, you know, I'd, I'd like to change that one person at a time. I feel like it is changing. Like we're all wanting, we're all like appreciating that there's an experience that we can have with our births, that it doesn't have to be to show up and do whatever the hospital wants you to do. Like we can, there's room beyond just healthy mom and healthy baby for also like a happy mom and a good experience. Um, and I know for me, like my births have been very transformative. They were life changing. They were huge like moments in my lives and like my first birth makes me really sad because I gave birth in a hospital with a provider that was not having a good day and it like I, I've only had three of these experiences in my lives and for one of them to be like this negative experience because one person was like I don't really want to provide care for you today is like it's really sad um so yeah it's really sad I mean everybody has a bad day but I think that the hospital model encourages more bad days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the fact that you said that you're happy with your job, like you find satisfaction and you love what you're doing. But a lot of people who work in a hospital, potentially, they, they go home and they're just like defeated or just like exhausted from having to deal with work all day in a way that maybe doesn't align with their actual views. Um, so it's, there are a few of us that can say that we're happy and enjoy our jobs, but not, not everyone, which is sad. Yeah. If you're a deeply empathetic person or a caring person, you can't possibly watch what goes on in a labor and delivery unit at the hospital and not have internal stress. And so you have to compartmentalize that and you have to kind of shift it into a different realm because otherwise the alternative is unthinkable that every day you're witnessing things that you know are wrong. And you can't speak up about it. So either you become a zombie or you become a useful idiot or you become disenchanted. You know, it's not really fair. There are people who really think they're doing good work and sometimes they do. I mean, this is not bad mouthing hospitals for sick people, but I'm bad mouthing the hospital model for well people. That's the problem. And most pregnant women are well and the hospital does not serve them and the people working in it. They've been doing it for so long, they cannot see outside their box. You know, there's an old saying from uh, I think Upton Sinclair. He says that it's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not understanding it. And I think that that applies really well here. If your salary depends on you being compliant and telling all your clients that they have to be delivered by 41 weeks because that's what your hospital group says, when you know that that's not really true, but you have to say it anyway, because if you tell somebody that they can go beyond 41 weeks, your partners are going to get mad at you or your system is going to tell you that you're, you know, you're fired and you know you're going to get called in on Monday morning and get yelled at for advocating for a woman's choice. Well, how do you deal with that? You have to somehow bury that or you walk away. And then walking away from something that you spent 12 years of your life achieving and an incredible amount of effort and not to mention money and loans and things like that that you owe it's very hard to walk away. How do you tell somebody who's now 40 years old, that's been practicing for 10 years, who doesn't like their work, who's making a decent salary, but doesn't like their work to quit? I think that people are learning more about it. And I think that the younger doctors now have given up autonomy for lifestyle. And I'm not saying that that's wrong because I've given up my whole practice for lifestyle right now. But you know, they're okay being a corporate employee, knowing that they don't have to take a beeper home they're not on call except once every seventh night or something like that. And that at five o'clock, they go home, they're off. And they have their paid vacations and they know, and they're not going to miss out on anything. So it's attracting a different sort of person going into medicine in the first place, if doctors understand that or medical students understand what they're getting themselves into. Because people who really want to be captain of their own ship really have no place in my profession anymore. Because you can't. You can't run your own show when you go into obstetrics. The private practice of obstetrics is very difficult to do anymore. They make it almost impossible economically to run a private practice. And so you end up getting a job. And when you're a job, you're working for somebody and you and then you're just a cog in the wheel. And uh, I wish they would demand more from their training programs. I wish they demand to learn breech birth, to bring it back fully around and, and to be able to offer women this choice 
which is such a beautiful and reasonable thing to do. And I'll just leave it at that. Well, we definitely appreciate chatting with you so much. And thank you so much for your time. And I know all of our followers will also really enjoy this conversation as well. Yeah, so they can find me at birthinginstincts.com is my website. Got a lot of information on there. And on Instagram, I'm at birthinginstincts. And I've limited myself to social media on that. And then, of course, the podcast this has got this incredible original name called the Birthing Instincts Podcast. <laughs> everything, everything is Birthing Instincts. So um, hopefully it's easy to That's find. That's easy right? to find. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today and listening to this episode. If you want more support throughout your pregnancy, join our prenatal fitness programs and childbirth education course. If you need more support after birth, join our postpartum fitness programs and education courses. If you're a professional, we offer birth worker and fitness trainer courses so you can learn from us and earn CEUs. Explore all our courses on our website at mamasayfit.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow our podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. Leave a review and share with your friends. We release new episodes every Wednesday. This podcast is sponsored by Needed, a nutrition company focused on optimal nourishment for your perinatal journey. Use code MAMASAYPOD for 20% off your first Needed order.